You know, I love it when the church can be the church and when we realize it's so much larger than these four walls, that when we, when we gather together and when we worship with one another, just the comfort in knowing that we don't gather alone, that there are those who gather throughout this community, throughout this state, throughout this world, that on this day they proclaim the love, and the mercy, the grace of Jesus Christ, and that we know that we do that together. There's just such a strength and such an encouragement when it comes to the church. I'm so thankful for, for you all, for coming, for sharing of your gifts, for your talents, and for worshiping with us uh, today. It's just been a wonderful, wonderful blessing. Well, today we are concluding a series that we started six weeks ago uh, entitled The Life of Job, Enduring the Storms. And what we quickly realized as we got reacquainted with Job, because some of us know him from Sunday school when we were kids. Others of us may have heard about Job, you know, when we were going through a difficult time and, and someone said, well, you just need to have the patience of Job or the, the faith of Job or, or you just need to get through it like Job. And, and maybe you kind of nodded your head, but you really didn't know what that meant. Um, and so we've been walking through what does that mean? Why is Job lifted up as one who really did overcome and endure the storm of life? You know, we talked about how suffering and how storms of life, they come into each and every one of our lives. In fact, if you're not currently going through the storm, chances are you just came out of one or you're getting ready to go into one. It's just kind of life as we know it. And we realized the first week something that we don't like to admit, but the longer we live, we know that it's true, that, that life isn't always fair. I mean, we like for it to, to be, if I do this and, I, and I, I'm this way, then I can expect this result. But sometimes in life, even when we, with our best intentions, we find ourselves in places that we never intended to be. And we, we wonder and we have that question, that one word question that we shout out to God in the midst of those moments. And the, the word is this, why? God, why are we going through it? Lord, why is, is this taking place in our life? God, why in the world would this be happening to me? And we, we, did, we uncovered Job, and you know, we uncovered in week one how, how there was this conversation taking place in heaven that Job and none of his friends knew about, his wife didn't know about, but it was between God and Satan, and where Satan approached God and said, you know, if I, if I take everything that, that your servant has, then surely he'll curse you. And so God allows him that permission, and, and Job takes away everything. And in one day, or Satan takes away everything, and in one day Job has lost all of his earthly possessions, and his children and family as well. The next time that Satan and God get together, and Job, Job has still not cursed God and died, Satan says, you know, if I, if I curse the man himself, if I place affliction on his body, give him illness and, and sores and boils, then he will curse you to your face. And, and so God allows this to take place. But he says on the, on the man himself, you know, don't take his life. And and so Job finds himself with sores and boils. And at this point in life, it, it's, it's, you know, you've gone from bad to worse. Have you ever gone from bad to worse in your situation where you thought there's no way it could get worse? And then the next day you thought, oh, there's another level. You know, I didn't, didn't realize that we were going deeper than, than what we had gone before. And that was Job. And in the midst of all of this, Job's friends come. And, and it's always great to have friends come. And his friends do it great for seven days. They, they provide comfort. They provide, you know, this, this support system. And then they begin to speak. And it goes downhill from there. And what we found was that when you're enduring the storms with friends, we talked about what that looks like when, when you're enduring the storms through criticism because Job's friends begin to criticize him, and, and that happens to all of us. You know, when you, when you endure the storms with family, because Job wasn't the only one who walked through this storm, his wife was with him there as well. We've talked about how you do that in a way that's honoring and pleasing to God. And then last week we talked about how do you endure the storm when God seems to be silent. And when God doesn't speak to you like he used to speak to you, when we, when we sing songs like this and it doesn't move us any longer and we just feel like, God, are you even there any longer? How do you serve him in the midst of that? And today we want to talk about a part of the storm that we typically don't talk about, but it's after the storm. How do we enjoy life after the storm has passed. Because here's something I want to guarantee you. It will pass. And I think we've all lived long enough and we've all endured storms to some degree that we realize that, that no matter how bad it seems or no matter how terrible it gets, that there is a moment 
where we see the clouds kind of begin to drift away. And even though the aftermath of the storm may be devastation, the storm itself has definitely passed. And so how do we live from that moment on? Because as I've pastored for a number of years and I've, I've met and talked with many, many people who've gone through storms far worse than I have, one of the most tragic things I see in life is when a storm has defined a person to such a degree that even though it took place years ago, it's still as though it's happening in the moment. Or even though the devastation, I mean, it just seemed to be like of distant memory for everyone else. For that person, it's just so real, and they can never get past the hurt or the pain that that storm caused in their life. And it seems to taint everything around them. It taints their very life. It taints every relationship. It's as though they can't move past what took place during that storm. But Job seems to do it. And in fact, as we open up today, we're going to open up to to Job chapter 42. And as we we answer this question, what do you do? How do you do live life after the storm? I believe we're going to see that Job not only does it well, he does it exceptionally well. We pick up in Job chapter 42, verse 10. And after God has has come and he's he's been present, he's been real. You know, last week we realized that, that God will speak. He may be silent for a season, but he will speak. And in fact, what we have that Job doesn't have is we have the written word of God. And if you feel like God is being silent in your storm right now, what I want to encourage you to do is to just dive into God's word because he will speak because it's his word. And there's going to be this moment as you're reading where you just feel like, God, that's, that's for me. God, I, I, can, I can actually hear you speaking to me. And in that moment, God's no longer going to be silent. He, that silence is going to be broken. And for Job, it was not only written, but it was just this audible voice from God. It convicted him because Job, like all of us, had begun to question life. He began to question God's intentions. He never cursed God, but he was definitely confused by God, much like we all have been. And after he confesses and he repents before the Lord, Verse 10 says, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Now, if you're just joining with us today, it kind of feels like you jumped in to the very end of the story. You walked in on the end of the movie, and so there may not be a context there for you. But what we find is that just a few chapters before, Job is there with his friends, and they've been dialoguing back and forth all through Job. And they've been kind of criticizing Job, and then Job would kind of state his defense. And they've been talking about, you know, the character of God, and Job would state what he believes. And it's just been this back and forth. And then God shows up. (laughs) Have you ever been talking about someone, and then they come into the room? This is what happens with Job and his friends. And as they're talking about who God is and what he's done and all of his intentions, God shows up and he proves Job right by saying, what Job has spoken is true, and what you have spoken, speaking about his friends, is false. And he chastised him for it. And he says, here's what you need to do. You need to go and offer a sacrifice and ask for forgiveness. But I don't want you to pray. In fact, I want Job to pray for you. And verse 10 says, after Job had prayed for his friends, the friends that were critical, the friends that were criticizing the friends that were degrading Job's character, the friends that had began to make it personal. They weren't talking about the the problem any longer. Now they had moved to just who Job was as a person. For those friends, Job prayed. And after he prays, it says, The Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Now in Job chapter 1, we realize that Job was the greatest man of all the East. He had the greatest possessions. He had the greatest stature. He, I mean, everything. If you think who's the best in the land, the the name was obvious. It was Job. And so for Job to not only be restored as the wealthiest man in all the world, now he's restored twice as much. You say, well, what in the world took place? Well, I believe that God knew something and has known something that's critical for us to realize if we're going to live on this side of the storm. And that is forgiveness is the hinge to God's blessing. 
You see that Job prayed for his friends, and as they they began to to confess their sins and they offered their sacrifice before the Lord, do you know how hard it's to pray for someone if you haven't really forgiven that person? It doesn't happen. I mean, I've never seen that prayer. I've never seen just through the gritted teeth, God, forgive them. You know, you know, but even though we may feel that way at times, but for Job, there had to be this, this literal forgiveness that took place, not be, just between him and God, but between him and his friends, him and those who were closest to him, for that relationship to be restored. Because as, as he does that, all of a sudden it just begins to open up the blessings of God. And you say, well, well you know, what is it that causes that? I believe it's forgiveness. And when you think about your own life, I mean, how many of us in our own life, if we were to be honest and say, who wants God to bless you, we would not raise our hands, right? I mean, yeah, okay, that sounds great. I mean, blessing or the, the opposite, I'm going to go with blessing. But yet we find in Scripture that, that all of God's blessing, I mean, it hinges on this idea of forgiveness. It's why Christ sent his son, why God sent his son, Jesus Christ to pay for our sins, to offer forgiveness for us, that we might have a relationship with with him once again. What greater blessing than to have a relationship with God restored? But it hinges on forgiveness. And for Job, as he looks at this storm and as he looks at the aftermath and all of the things that have taken place, he forgives his friends, he finds forgiveness from God, and all of a sudden he experiences the blessings that follow. And God wasn't done. In fact, verse 11 says, All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him, and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. You know, that, that's a tradition we've seen to have lost. That'd be fun to pick up again, right, you know? But it says all his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before. Now now think of that. Everyone who had known him before. Who's included in that? How about Job's wife? Who had told Job early in this story. Job, Job, you you just need to curse God and die. Right? I mean, I don't know what you're holding on to here. And what we find is is the words of of a woman who's been very, very hurt. I mean, we we think of Job losing all of his resources and Job losing all of his his children, but we often don't think that there was a wife who lost exactly the same amount. And some would say even to a greater degree as a mother loses a child. But it says everyone was there and they came. And what we find is that as, as Job has children later on in life that this relationship with his wife that seemed to be so fragile in the midst of the storm and and married folks you know this in the midst of our storms our relationships are tested and we see his wife is still there we see we see the four friends the the three who were there at the beginning and then the other one who had came along to kind of throw some jabs in at Job at the last minute we see those four friends if everyone's there then those four friends have to be there and that's a powerful statement of reconciliation that's taken place and as all the brothers and sisters and everyone who's known him they come and they eat and they don't just celebrate the great blessing that God has given right because because God's already blessed double what Job had before, right? So, so Job was, was wealthy at this point, but I mean now, I mean, it's just like ridiculous wealthy. But they don't just come to celebrate what God is doing. No, no, it says they, they've comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him. Because you and I both know what Job knew intimately is that even though the storm may pass, the wounds that are left from the storm, I mean, we're always going to carry those to some degree. It's always going to hurt. I mean, there's always going to be a part of us that looks back and we don't look back on it fondly and go, man, I would just love to go through that again. But there's something that we see in Job's life as his friends and his family gather around him that there's a con- just a consoling that begins to take place of all that has happened, all the pain that Job went through, all the difficulty. And now he has what we desired for him to have at the beginning. He has the comfort of friends and family. 
And we see at this moment that Job begins to have a choice to make. In fact, verse 12 says, The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. Now, this next part may not make a lot of sense to you, but, but, but if you just want to listen with, with an open perspective, I just want to share with you. He had 14,000 sheep. I'm not even a sheep herder, and that sounds like a lot, right? 6,000 camels. Remember last time he had 3,000, and we said, man, Job had a tremendous shipping industry in the east, right, because that's what camels would have been used for. Now he's got 6,000. His shipping you know, business has doubled. A thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. Now, if you remember how many children Job lost, we see that he's been restored. Those same ten. And while I can never imagine that losing a child is ever something that is forgotten, what we find is that Job is comforted with his wife in having ten more. And we see that the Lord has truly blessed Job. He's not only blessed him in business, which is is nice and it's amazing, but we realize that very early on in Job, Job doesn't care about that stuff anymore. Because when the storm gets so deep, I mean, you don't care about the things of this world any longer. You just, I mean, you just want to get through the storm. And and it's nice to have them, but but it's kind of the least of your concerns. But God has just poured out his blessing upon Job as he's found forgiveness in God and found uh, forgiveness with his friends. And and God has has poured out this blessing. And then he's he's blessed abundantly by, by adding back to his family. It says this of his daughters in verse 15. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so Job died, an old man and full of years. Now when you read that verse, that that, that phrase, full of years... It's really this phrase of contentment. I mean, Job not only lived a long life, but he was content with his life. He not only lived a long life, but he enjoyed his life. You know, he was, he was one of those older folks that you just, you like to be around. They're not mad, they're not cranky, but, but they're, they're actually enjoying life. That was Job's life. He, he, he lived a full and long life. And you think, you know, how easy it must have been. I mean, how confusing for Satan to begin to see this play out because we all know what storms begin to do in our life. And we know how they can affect us. And I said Job had a choice to make. And here's the choice Job had to make. He could either live in this fullness of life after the storm or he could remain bitter. And wouldn't it have been easy to do? I mean, when I, when I think of Job's story, when I, when I think of all of the things Job has gone through, and then I, I look at our own lives, and I, and I think of all the times we just become bitter about our situations. And, and I realized something as I was you know, praying about this, this message this week. It says that bitterness blocks blessing. It's like God can't give us the things that he desires to give us when we're clinging on to our bitterness and our rage and our anger. Why? Because we can only hold so many things at one time. And until we let those things down, can we truly receive what God has for us? And had Job decided to hang on to to bitterness, I don't think he could have experienced all of the things that God had in store for him. And I wonder how many times in our own life, Do we hang on to the hurts and the pain of the past? And we miss out on what God desires to do in our life. Not because God doesn't will it, but because we're unwilling to let go of the pain that's there. You know, this week, you may have noticed there's something different about my face. (laughs) And it's okay. You can laugh because I'm an idiot. All right. So let's uh, let's just kind of throw that out there. Um, It's okay. And and this week I had the awesome opportunity. I'm so thankful for my wife for giving me this birthday present. I turned 41 this week, um, which is very surreal to me. And but you know I I turned 41 and and we were supposed to do this last year and 
you know, kind of life happened. And so Kim said, you know, this year I want you to go do what we had planned for your 40th birthday. I want you to go out and hike in Colorado and stay with your mom and dad in the cabin and, and you know, just have a good time. And so, so on um, Sunday night at 1230 at night after service Sunday and, you know, we went through the day. And then 1230, uh, Tom and I, we set up for Atlanta. And we, we drove, my brother-in-law and I drove to Atlanta. We, we took the flight, and we got in, you know, um, that next day into Colorado. We drove from Denver down to Colorado Springs. And, man, we just had a great week. It was phenomenal. And, and we, we hiked Mount Humble, which is a, a 14er, and, and uh, it was an 11-mile round trip. And it, about halfway, I thought, I'm going to die. And then, you know, I didn't die. And uh, it was awesome. It was great. And we made it to the top, and we got to, you know, yay! celebrate and then we hiked down and no one died still and then we, you know, the next couple days we went to the sand dunes and and I thought you know these aren't near as high as those mountains but these mountains were made of sand and so it's like when you hike up sand I don't know if you're aware of this you sink and so like we're hiking up sand and it was the hardest thing and and we finally get to the top and we get to celebrate like woo and then we run down like idiots and we run down the sand and fall and tumble and hurt our hamstrings and all that good stuff because you're in your 40s now and and then, you know, then after that, I said, you know, let's, what do you want to do? He's like, you want to go home? I'm like, no, let's go hike more. And so then we hiked Zapata Falls, and we, we hiked up to the falls, and we, you know, went through the rocks and the streams and the waterfall and everything, and it was awesome and amazing. And he said, all right, now let's go get pizza. And I'm like, man, this is great. You know, like, this is awesome. And so we, we drive down, and we get to the gas station, and, and we go get some Gatorade, you know, got to rehydrate. And then we're coming out, and I open the car door, and I crack my head on the corner of the door. And I sat down and I thought, you're an idiot. I mean, I mean, all the hiking and the elevation and everything else, and you're going to crack your head on a car door? Come on. You've been doing this for a long time. 41 years you've been getting into cars. You should know how to get in without hitting your head on the door. And as I sat down, I thought, you know, maybe it's not bleeding. And then I looked in the mirror and I thought, no, that's, that's a good one. You know, that's a, that's a good one. And Tom comes out with the Gatorade, and, and uh, you know, I, I had my hand covered. I was like, you know, I, I did something. And <laughs> he's like, what'd you do? And then I like, raised my hand. He's like, oh, you know, and then you know how bad it is. But other people's reaction, like some of yours today, you're like, hey, I'm like, oh, you know, hey. And then you don't like eye contact with me. Hey, what's up? Um, but I, I found myself in that moment, and I knew what I had done. Right? I mean, the, you know, my little storm had come and it had passed, and, and I was so angry at myself. I mean, I just sat there, you know, we, we called our wives, and, you know, they said what wives are supposed to say. You need to go to the hospital. Don't try to do that. You know, don't let Tom bandage you up. You need to go to the hospital and get medical attention. And so the nearest hospital is like 26 miles in the opposite direction, and so we start driving down this country road, and I'm just quiet. I'm getting really angry, you know, and the more I think about it, I just thought, oh, you, you're such an, oh, come on, John, you know, and why, I mean, this is the last night of vacation, you're, you're going you're gonna to miss out on pizza, you know, this is going to, you know, and, and I was just getting so, so mad and irritated, and, and then all of a sudden it hit me, and God reminded me of what I was preaching on on Sunday, and I realized, you know, there's nothing I can do to change what's happened. Because that's what we like to do at first. We like to think, what could I have done differently? I mean, if I would have just slowed down, if I would have just kind of opened it up slower, if I hadn't been such a stinking hurry, you know, I, you know, this wouldn't have happened. But that doesn't matter anymore. It's happened. It's taken place. And for Job, as he was sitting in the ashes in, in Job chapter 3, I can't even imagine what a father who's lost everything begins to replay in his mind. You know, if I would have, if I would have just, you know, sent more, you know, servants on this thing, then maybe they wouldn't have gotten attacked and, and I wouldn't have lost all my possessions. Or, man, if I would have just had the kids over today, they wouldn't have been there and that wouldn't have happened. And in the midst of all of those what if, what if, what if, eventually we come to the point where we realize it's happened. So now I have a choice to make. How am I going to respond to it? And so there in the car, I started laughing. I was like, Man, I'm an idiot. <laughs> and Tom agreed, you know. <laughs> and I told Tom, I said, you know, God must really want us to talk to someone at the hospital we're going to. 
and we begin to drive when we pull in and we meet Leroy, who's the nurse, and as he's kind of checking me in and asking me questions, Tom asks him, hey, man, where do you go to church? And, and Leroy gets that face that all of us look like when you know, a pastor asks you, where do you go to church? You know, And, and Leroy says, you know, I, I haven't been going for a while. You know, I moved here a couple years ago. I used to be really involved, and, and I moved here a few years ago. And, and Leroy just begins to tell us his story. We got to talk with him about what it means to be in Christian community and what it means to have brothers and sisters in Christ and how important it is to sharpen one another. And, and then this, I mean, we got to have prayer with Leroy right there as we're waiting for the nurse to come in and glue me up, you know. And we laughed and we said, you know, everything happens for a reason. Now, sometimes the reason is you're stupid and you should have slowed down, but, yeah, but still, I mean, God can turn these things are around for good. And even when we think we, we've messed it up, and even when we think we're not doing it right, that, that if we'll just simply lay down our bitterness, lay down our anger, and say, God, what is it that you want to use me to do today? It's amazing the blessings that can begin to come into our life. And I don't know what Leroy's story will be. But I know we got to encourage him and speak into him and pray for him. You know, we were talking about his character, and he said, he kind of laughed, and he said, you guys, I mean, that's nice of you to say, but you really don't know me. And we said, you know, but Leroy, we see inside of you, and man, God's got great plans for you, brother. When we hang on to our bitterness, I believe we miss out on the blessings that God has for our life. Some of you here today, you may be going through that storm, and, and you may be really questioning about why, and, and I don't know why. You know, for Job, he never knew why. Maybe when he saw God face to face, maybe when he died and went to heaven and he realized the story of his life, but, but throughout his life, he never understood the reasoning behind what was taking place. And we may never understand the reason why we go through the storms that we go through. And for Job, he experienced blessing on this earth. And you know what? Some of us may not experience the same type of blessing on this earth. But I guarantee you God's blessing will come. Whether it's here or whether when we see him face to face. And as Job, as I was reading this passage and just kind of going over the scripture, I was reminded of what Job said in Job 23, verse 10. In the midst of his depression, in the midst of his despair, without ever knowing that God was even going to answer, when God was still silent, here's what Job said. Yet he knows the way I have taken, speaking of God, and he has tested me, and I will emerge as pure gold. Job says, like, I don't understand the reason why, but I've got faith that God knows I'm here. <laughs> he not only knows I'm here, but he understands my situation. And he is going to reward me for it. And for some of you here today, I just want to speak into your life and say, God knows where you are. He understands what you're going through, and his blessings will come. The enemy would love for you to curse God and walk away. But I believe God is calling you today to realize that he is here and he is present and he loves you. He has a plan for you. And his blessings are coming. But here's our part. We need to forgive. And we need to let go of the bitterness. To realize that things have happened. They've taken place. They weren't what we desired, but, but here we are. So, God, where do you want us to go? I want you to pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you today, Lord, I don't know the storms that are represented in this room. But, God, I know that they are real to each and every person who's walking through it. And, Lord, for some of us, we've, we've let a storm define our life. We've been bitter ever since that storm. Our relationships have changed. Our personality has changed. We no longer sing the same. We no longer praise you the same. God, we go through the motions. But, Lord, if we're to be honest, that's all we do. 
And God, I believe today that you're calling us to something greater, that you desire for us to have life and life abundantly. But Lord, in order to receive that which you have to give, Lord, we have to lay down this bitterness and anger that we let dwell up within us, that we've been hanging on to for days, for weeks, for months, for years. God, I pray today that you would set captives free because we become captives in our own prison. And everything in our life suffers because of it. God, I pray for those who wonder if you're really here, that you would show them today just how much you love them. That as we sing today, Lord, that that your spirit would just fall afresh and anew upon them. Lord, that today we would realize, Lord, no matter what's taking place, we've got today to move forward and proclaim you as God. To walk with eyes wide open to see how it is that you would desire to use us to bless others. Lord, speak to us today, I pray. I pray that you would heal hearts today. And that we would begin to truly live after the storm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.